Well, good day, friends, and welcome to the noon hour of news. No, it just sounds like the news, the news hour, doesn't it? This is one of those fall publishing webinars, and I'm Chris Beatty's editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine and the e-newsletter Acres Online, and I'm going to be your host for the next uh, hour or so as we learn more about making a seamless transition to hydrofiber advanced substrates. Now, what is hydrofiber, and why would you want to make a seamless transition to it, uh, or any kind of transition to it? Well, that's what our two guest experts are here to tell us. Both are veterans of my Grower Talks webinar, so perhaps you've heard from them here before. Let me introduce them. Our first is uh, Jennifer Newyar. Let me get my slide changing. There it is. Jennifer uh, is the business manager, horticulture for Profile Products. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Chris. Glad to be here. All right. And, and where is, I know here is the webinar, but where is here from you? Where are you broadcasting from today? I am in an undisclosed location in Illinois t today. Uh, in this, you, you guys are into the undisclosed locations. I remember Daniel, our next guest last time, wouldn't disclose his location. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll spill the beans on where that was. It was pretty funny. Uh, and uh, so it's great to have you here, Jennifer. And again, to help Jennifer out, we do have, uh, we have invited back Mr. Daniel Norton. He's the Manager of Technical Services Horticulture for Profile Products. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, Chris. Glad to be here. All right. So uh, last time, should I say where you were broadcasting from last time? Uh, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. A, a 1989 Pinto. That's no, right. It, <laughs> it, was, it was your 90. car. <laughs> you were you were broadcasting from your car, which shows I think that's great. You can do a webinar from any place where you've got a good internet connection, basically. So where are you broadcasting from today? You got to tell me. Is it a Starbucks, a McDonald's, a greenhouse? Uh, no, I'm actually in South Carolina, uh, undisclosed location as well. All right, on the road though. Uh, yeah. All right, so very good. And of course, well, you guys know me. I'm not on the road. I'm broadcasting live from the uh, palatial, luxurious Brewer Talk Studios, high atop Brewer Talks Tower. Now, uh, all right, before I turn it over to Jennifer, a little bit of housekeeping. So usually, I'll get one or two messages saying, where's the audio? And I pop this slide up just for those folks, but apparently you read it. Everybody read it at the beginning, got yourself hooked up, because everybody seems to be able to hear us right now. That's beautiful, and I hope it stays that way. Uh, now, um, as we go along, you're bound to have some questions. I know I will. I can just ask them on a microphone. You guys don't have that luxury. Use either the chat area or the Q&A area, whichever is kind of most convenient for you. Uh, if you've got a question, as we go along, if it's pertinent to what uh, these guys are talking about at the time, I'll interrupt. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll put it out there. Otherwise, we'll save some time at the end. And if it's just too technical uh, or requires too much of an answer, I'm going to share their contact information so you'll be able to uh, get, it, get it handled that way. Um, and lastly, I didn't, oh, I forgot to put in my archive uh, slide here. Oh, next time. Uh, it's at the end. But if you have to leave for some reason um, and you want to come back and watch this webinar again, you'll be able to. We're recording it right now, are we? Yes, it is recording. Beautiful. Um, you just go to growertalks.com slash webinars, the same place you signed up for it conveniently. So that said, uh, Jennifer, you're going to take it away. So are you all set? I am all set. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate right. that introduction. You know, uh, we have been selling hydrofiber for nearly 10 years. Chris, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, thank you. We started primarily selling outside of the United States, and the reason for that is, is there was just a really strong interest in having a peat alternative or something more sustainable, primarily in Europe. That's where we started nearly 10 years ago selling our product. About five years ago, we transitioned to selling to some of the largest blenders in North America. Again, there was an interest in having an alternative to, to primarily perlite at the time. Uh, so we started selling to some of the largest blenders. And just recently, uh, probably about three years ago, also started selling to some growers in the industry. Um, there, these are growers primarily that have their own mix lines on site. They were already used to buying in raw materials, and so uh, picking up our material as a raw material that they incorporated into their mixes was just kind of a natural progression. Um, we've made an incredible amount of progress in a short amount of time. Uh, everyone that works with our 
product needs a specialized piece of equipment in order to work with that. Uh, to date, we've installed at nearly 44 locations, and we're adding a new one uh, almost weekly right now. There's just so much demand for this product in the marketplace. Um, it's really been quite awesome uh, to see uh, the pickup and the interest level. We uh, could tell you uh, we're going to spend this uh, webinar talking a little bit about what makes Hydrofiber really different and unique, but our customers probably say it best. Um, they are by far and away our best salesmen, and if you talk to someone that's using Hydrofiber, uh, they'll tell you what a difference it's made in their business. If I had to sum up uh, two of the big things that our customers tell us with regards to our product, it probably centers around two things. Uh, the first thing they tell me all the time is, look, Jennifer, uh, stop selling so hard. Your product sells itself. Um, it's made such a difference in my business. I was able to bring it in and help it help have it help me resolve uh, a problem um, that I was having in my substrate mix. Um, and the second thing they'll probably tell you is, look, the Hydrofiber team that's out there servicing the customers is really top notch. Uh, we uh, we have a fully staffed technical team. All of us travel all the time. So when Chris uh, asked us where we were. Um, it's not unusual for you to hear that we're someplace very, uh, very different, remote or random, because uh, all of us are traveling every, every, uh, every week. And uh, when people ask me where I work, I often tell them I feel like I work at the airport or on an airplane. Um, so we're out there in the marketplace, really trying to help make sure that the transition is, uh, is as seamless as possible. And this webinar today is really again another tool that we're providing to the marketplace to help answer questions regarding hydrofiber. So I know there are probably a few people on this call that maybe don't know much about Hydrofiber. So we wanted to give you a brief introduction on Hydrofiber. Um, then we're going to transition to talking a little bit about uh, the main things you need to do when making the transition to a Hydrofiber blend, whether you're blending yourself or whether you're buying a premix from one of our blending partners. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about the specialized piece of equipment. We'll tell you a little bit about um, some upcoming opportunities you'll have to interact with us more. And we'll take some questions, just like Chris uh, had alluded to at the beginning. So here are some of the facts with regards to our product. Uh, we make it only from southern yellow pine. Uh, those of you that know Hydrofiber, uh, Hydrofiber's parent company, Profile Products, you'll know that we, we make a lot of different products from woods. We're very uh, specialized in wood and wood species. But in the particular instance of hydrofiber, we use southern yellow pine because that is the species that the academics have done all their research on, and they tell us that that's the best uh, species for plant growth. Uh, the way that we make it is also very unique, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. But because of our uh, patent pended technology, we're able to make a fiber that has tremendous surface area, and that surface area translates itself back to a product that holds a lot of water but also um, makes a lot of airspace available. Um, and in the beginning, a lot of our customers had a hard time wrapping their head around that because it's not often that a particle will give you both properties. This is a picture of our factory. Um, it's just one of uh, several factories we have where we refine wood. Um, we make hydrofiber uh, just right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And the reason we make it there is because, uh, again, southern yellow pine is our main uh, species that we use for hydrofiber. It's the only species we use, and we're located in the heart of our supply. Uh, so that's the main reason we make the product in North Carolina. As I said earlier, uh, we have a unique process for making our product, um, very uh, unique to the industry. Uh, because we're making only raw materials, wood fiber being one of them, uh, we can afford to be very specialized in this area, and so we have a highly technical system uh, that allows us to do it. We use heat pressure and steam, and in, in less than about 10 minutes' time, we're able to make our product um, uh, through, uh, through, uh, through these three elements. And it gives us a product, again, uh, that has tremendous surface area, uh, and that surface area translates itself back to a particle that gives you airspace as well as a lot of areas uh, to hold uh, water um, water and moisture. Because we make the product in a factory, uh, we're able to make the product consistent so that it's the same all of the time. So we offer several different diameters of fibers. Uh, these fibers always arrive with a pH of around 4.5, 4 and we always supply our materials at about 20%. It doesn't matter which fiber you use. Um, they're always the same. 
Uh, we run QC in our plant every 30 minutes, and we barcode every bag that goes out uh, the door of our factory. Um, so should you ever have an issue with our product, we're able to actually take it, take it and trace it back to day of manufacturing so we can determine what might be an issue if there is one. I'll tell you that one of the things that our customers tell us they like the most about our product is the fact that it is so consistent and so reliable. Once they make the transition, a lot of them start rather, um, uh, rather I would say, modest with inclusion rate, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent. Usually after the first year, though, however, uh, because they appreciate the fact that our product is always the same and very consistent, they're often looking for ways uh, to really ramp up their use. And in some instances, we have customers that go to 40 and 50 percent inclusion on some products. Uh, Jennifer, quick question from me sure. and from, uh, from Janet, who just asked it as well. She typed it in. What does WB stand for? Do we need to know oh, that? Great question. Um, that's our, that's just a short way of saying wood bark. So our product uh, is containing um, mostly cambium from the tree, but we also add a small percentage of bark. It helps us to get a certain pH property, which we really enjoy uh, as it relates to our product. It also gives our product a natural colorant. Um, our first generation materials were without bark. Uh, but our customers told us that they appreciated, they wanted to have a fiber that didn't stand out as much in the soil. They wanted something that blended easier. Uh, we could choose to uh, actually dye our fiber if we wanted to. We've chosen not to do that. We like the fact that our, fi our fiber is OMRI listed and suitable for organic use. And if we would have used synthetic dyes, it would not be possible. So um, that's just our way of giving the product a natural color and, and allows us to make it completely OMRI listed. Okay, and do the numbers go like from lighter to heavier or finer to more coarse as we go from 065 up to 365? Great question. So 065 is actually our finest fiber and 365 is one of our coarser fibers. We're able to uh, change our refining plates um, so that allows us to get different diameters and those diameters allow us to have thinner and thicker fibers and that will uh, impact things such as longevity, water holding capacity, air space. Um, so we're able to actually between these SKUs, able to provide the market most of what they want. Um, in the instance that a customer wants a unique property, we can actually create um, a unique fiber diameter for them. Very good, thank you. So one of the things that the market talks about all the time is, is, is wood and, and whether wood's gonna tie up nitrogen as we're talking about a hydrofiber is in fact made from southern yellow pine. We get asked a lot about um, wood and uh, nitrogen drawdown. And what I would say to that is, um, you know, not all woods are the same. I feel like when we started talking about hydrofiber years ago, our main uh, message was really that wood's not bad, wood can be good. Um, because most people had been conditioned to believe that wood wasn't always the safest growing media for growing plants in. However, fast forward now a couple years later, there's been a lot of talk of wood. There's been a lot of different attempts at trying different types of wood products. Um, what I'll say now is that wood are not all the same. And I know there's a couple of people on this call. Uh, Dr. Brian Jackson, I think you logged in. Uh, he'll tell you that as well. Uh, and there's a lot of differences in wood and wood processing and how things are handled. In, in, in the instance of hydrofiber, the way that we make it, it allows us to make a product, a fiber that has a very low bulk density. And when you talk to even uh, any of our customers, but also in particular the blenders of our, that are customers that really look at uh, characteristics and bulk density, they will tell you that one of the things they like most about our product is the fact that we do have a very low bulk density, which lends itself to higher inclusion rates than a lot of other wood, uh, wood type products. So in this particular graph, uh, what we're showing here is a study we did a few years ago actually with North Carolina State University. Uh, because we wanted to look at nitrogen drawdown. Um, and you can see the lower line, the red line, actually that shows you what would happen if you grow in our material at 100%. Um, the only people that are using hydrofiber at 100% are people that are growing hydroponically. Um, you can do it very successfully with our hydrofiber. Um, most commercial growers, however, are using anywhere from 10 to 40%, I would say, of our product as part of their mix. And so you can see the top line, the blue line is peat moss and peat moss at 100%, and what that, what that tends to do um, in a growing situation. However, if you look at the three lines between the red line, which is 100% hydrofiber, and the blue line, which is peat moss, you can see that anywhere from 10 to 30%, um, while there is a small uh, dip in the first seven days, 
after the first week, uh, we actually contribute nicely to the system, just like uh, other raw materials. And in fact, if you talk to any one of our customers, they'll tell you um, that they've not had to make major changes to their fertilization schedules. Um, in most instances, some customers have not made any change at all. And the reason for that is really, again, goes back to the magic and the way that we're able to make this, uh, this product with such a low bulk density. In this particular instance, we have an 80% peat, 20% hydrofiber product that we've, uh, that we've tested. Um, you can see that even though we're 20% of the volume, from a weight perspective in media, we're actually less than 10%. Uh, and that allows us, again, to be incorporated at higher inclusion rates than what might have been possible in the past with other wood products. So usually at this point in the conversation, uh, most customers, uh, they've either not heard about hydrofiber or they've heard a little bit about hydrofiber. And it kind of lends them to the question of, well, this sounds really kind of too good to be true. You're telling me that this product is made in a factory, so it's always the same. You're telling me that because it's made in a factory, it shows up when I want it to. And you're telling me that this product, because it's made in a factory and it's so highly compressed, um, that it will take up a lot less space. You know, this sounds kind of too good to be true. How, how much of this stuff can I use? So we actually commissioned a study with Dr. Glenn Frame from Auburn University. And on the left, you'll see a, uh, what I'm gonna call kind of the old industry control, which is 80% peat moss, 20% perlite. Um, on the right, you can see 70% peat, 30% hydrofiber, which I'm gonna call the new industry control. Uh, by far and away, most of the commercial growers were doing business with today, this is what they're doing, is a 30% blend. Uh, Dr. Glenn Fain would tell you if you asked him that there's no statistical difference. However, I think if you look at these plants, you can see um, that they're very comparable. Both are very sellable um, and both seem to be performing on par with each other, which is what we hear from our customers. Most customers start at 20 to 30%. Um, that's a safe inclusion rate for most people. They don't have to change much at that rate um, and they get comparable performance to what they had before. Um, again, on the left is the old industry control, 80% peat, 20% perlite. On the right is the new industry control, 60% peat, 40% hydrofiber. Uh, this is typical for what we see with customers that have been growing with hydrofiber uh, in year two or year three. Uh, they uh, start to learn more about the product. They enjoy the consistency, the reliability, uh, the fact that this product is, uh, is just easier to work with uh, once they've made the transition. And so many of them, especially when they go to larger pot sizes, are choosing to go to a higher inclusion rate. Um, we have a lot of customers that are doing their poinsettias and their fall moms in 40% hydrofiber now. Uh, fast forward then um, to the future. Uh, we have a lot of customers now looking at 50-50 blends. Um, they really like the root development. Again, Dr. Glenn Fain would tell you there's no statistical difference between these two pots. However, I, I personally feel like if you looked at the pots very closely, you can see a definite root advantage on the hydrofiber pot versus the um, old industry control 80% peat, 20% perlite. We hear all the time from our customers that they feel like they see a rooting uh, advantage. We hear from some customers that they feel like they see a uh, crop time advantage. Um, we hear from our customers that, uh, that make the transition, that the transition's rather seamless. And just to push the envelope of it, um, we, we continue ourselves to look at wood and how far you can go with wood. And so this particular uh, uh, trial all, went all the way up to 60% inclusion. So 40% peat, 60% hydrofiber. Um, I know we have a bunch of blender customers on the phone with us today, so I don't want to scare anybody. Uh, so, but we just continue to look at options and uh, we don't have anybody currently that I'm aware of going to 60% hydrofiber, um, but we've proven with Dr. Glenn Fain that it's certainly in the realm of possibilities. Jennifer, we've got a question about watering frequency. Sure. Um, maybe between the control and the, uh, the new control or between the, uh, you know, the various uh, 20, 30, 40, or uh, 30, 40, 60% uh, hydrofibers. Talk about that. 
That's a great question. I'm actually going to trend. This is a, it's almost like I, I don't know who made that comment, but I feel like I should pay you a dollar because that's actually a great transition to the next segment, which is making the transition to a hydrofiber blend. And one of the first things that Daniel Norden is going to talk about, because he's going to discuss this section, is water and water management. So I'll let Daniel answer the question regarding the Auburn trial, and then he can transition on to uh, making the seamless transition to, uh, to hydrofiber blends. All right. Sure. Willie, sure. Willie, you can collect it to uh, cultivate, maybe. <laughs> um, so the, the, the short answer for in the context of that particular slide is that in, in that trial, all the plants were watered at the same uh, same irrigation frequency and the same uh, fertility. Uh, so I believe it was 150 parts per million constant liquid feed, and they were all they were all watered the same. Um, that said, you know, in general, most of our customers report that you know 20 to, to up to 50 percent hydrofiber. Um, there are changes in container capacity as you go up in hydrofiber, but really, it, it really doesn't start to shift until you go over 50% hydrofiber from our from our testing. Um, so yeah, so as Jennifer said, um, we get asked all the time, you know, what kind of things are we going, are our customers going to need to do to make the transition as seamless as possible? They say, you know, um, okay, well, if if uh, the fertility, we don't have to have uh, many differences. That's that's all well and good. Um, but what other things do we need to be aware of? And so there's there's really three key things that we like to talk about uh, with growers uh, with regards to uh, making a seamless transition. The first one is water management. And um, so when we first started the development process several years ago with hydrofiber, um, and we started working with growers, um, some of our growers came back to us and they said, you know, the, the incredible thing is, um, you know, Particularly when these plants go to the store, uh, they're holding up much much better. And so this really caused us to start digging into this whole shelf life thing. And uh, we sent some samples in. We've, we've done, actually done quite a bit of testing, but in this particular instance, um, we sent uh, all uh, three different mixes. Uh, they all had 80% peat from the same peat source. Then we varied the 20% fraction of either hydrofiber 090, 20% uh, perlite, or 20% core. What well, we found um, when we compared the hydrofiber versus the perlite mix, we found that we increased freely available water by about 10%. Uh, then the thing that really surprised us is when we compared it to the mix with 20% core, we actually increased the freely available water by over 30%. And uh, if we go to the next slide, um, so we, we also saw some differences with regards to how different raw materials interact with water. Um, so Pete, as many of you know, um, uh, it has a waxy cuticle, which um, causes it to shed water. Um, and in most instances, people are using surfactants in order to come overcome this uh, hydrophobic nature of peat. Core, on the other hand, is uh, very hydrophilic. Um, however, if you look at these fibers under a microscope, you'll see that they are very, um, have pits and cavities. They act like tiny little sponges. They actually swell when they're hydrated and they hold uh, the water internally. And so that's one of the reasons why we think that, um, you know, we saw this difference in freely available water because the, the water is being held internally. And then you contrast that with hydrofiber, um, which we know that most of the water is held on the surface of the particle. And so we think that, uh, or believe that the roots are able to access the water off the surface of the fiber uh, much more readily. Daniel, PM Mark is asking uh, what type of uh, core was used? Uh, it was just a standard, um, core pith. Um, I honestly don't know the exact ratio of, of core to, um, you know, pith to uh, fiber, uh, but it was just a standard standard core grain. All right, gotcha. Yeah. All right, um, so some other things that we've seen in the field that we want to relay is uh, surface drying. So when we get um, uh, the, the, the mixes into the greenhouse, uh, one of the things that the growers see is this crusting that occurs on the surface. Uh, you can see in the upper left-hand corner that uh, the surface is dry. And if, so if your growers are only um, uh, judging their irrigation based on how dry the surface is, uh, they may be potentially overwatering the plant. Um, so we recommend that you remove the pots off the root balls, uh, particularly as you're getting used uh, to this new raw material, um, because what you'll see when you do that is you see that there's sufficient water uh, in, in the soil column for the plant. And so it, this is just one thing that um, we've seen time and time again from the field and uh, visual. Again, it's just very important that you don't base your irrigation solely on what, 
uh, the surface of the pot is telling you because in most instances there's still sufficient water in the container. The second thing um, as far as what we've seen in the field is mixes with hydrofiber are simply lighter than mi other mixes uh, with more conventional raw materials. On the left hand side of this slide is just kind of a, a general list of raw materials and their bulk tent densities as they would come out of the packaging typically. So they do have some moisture in these bulk density values. Uh, but the key thing is here that hydrofiber has significantly lower bulk density than all these other raw materials. And so when you add hydrofiber into the substrate at 30 or 40 percent, that pot is going to be much lighter. And so many growers are trained how to irrigate based on weight. And so they'll go and they'll pick up pots and then they'll judge when to water again. And so when you take uh, a lighter bulk density within that pot and you also combine that with the fact that you see more surface drying, many growers can um, make the mistake of watering too soon. And so this is a, something else that we uh, want to bring to the awareness of growers. Okay, so let's just review some takeaway points. Uh, so as we mentioned, traditional practices may need to be adjusting. So being able to recognize the surface drying as well as the lighter weight of the pots. Um, and we mentioned earlier that water management, uh, specifically uh, maintaining adequate levels of oxygen in the substrate are key in developing roots. Um, something we haven't really touched base on, but we're addressing here in the final three bullet points is with regards to wettability. Uh, first and foremost, we want to recognize that some raw materials do not wet easily, particularly peat and bark. Um, and so hydro, hydrofiber uh, is hydrophilic. However, since most of our customers are doing like a 70% peat, 30% hydrofiber blend, it's still critical that you, uh, at the time of blending, that you're adding the right amount of moisture. You don't want to add too much, uh, but you certainly want to avoid adding too little water at the time of blending so that the mix is wet up readily. Um, it's far easier in our experience to um, add water to the mix at time of blending, um, whereas if, if you don't add enough water at the time of blending, it goes into the pots, and once it goes into the greenhouse, uh, it becomes much more difficult to wet those containers up uh, once the mix is in the pot. And we recommend that um, for growers that are using peat or bark-based blends, uh, that they do add a surfactant. Um, just because it helps um, great, greatly reduce the instances of poor wettability for those types of mixes. However, um, for if you're using a core hydrofiber blend, uh, we haven't seen any uh, any uh, wettability issues, so we, we don't feel there's a need for surfactants in those in, in that instance. Daniel Rees is asking, uh, how about the physical stability of hydrofiber? How does it hold yeah. up over time? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, we, we offer four different fibers. We actually have a fifth fiber, which has been primarily sold in Europe. Um, but, uh, you know, so all of our fibers will hold up for at least 12 months in the container. Okay, so all four or five of our fibers um, for most bedding plants are going to be more than sufficient in terms of stability and not degrading. However, if you're growing trees and shrubs, um, I would recommend that you look at the 365, which would be a, a thicker fiber. Thicker fiber diameter is going to be less resistant to degradation over time. That particular fiber is rated for about two and a half years. We have another fiber, which I mentioned earlier, which is primarily sold in Europe, which is called 510. And that's been used for quite a while in tree and shrub production, so very long-term crops. All right, another question on watering while we're, while we're on the topic. Uh, sure. Ray is uh, ex experimenting with 100% hydrofiber for orchids uh -huh. uh, using clear pots. He says he notes that uh, he sees that the after irrigation sees that the fibers are saturated, but the space bet uh, between the fibers remains open rather than being filled uh, with water held by surface tension like you get with most other media ingredients. How do you explain that? So is it wet enough, or should there be more water in there that the fibers aren't holding? No, I think I think that's pretty common. Um, you know, I think it's you know, you know, 100 percent is really kind of a, 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 a you know, different beast. Um, you know, it's just really the ability of the wood fibers to suspend the water, um, you know, differently than other traditional raw materials. I, I don't know the exact uh, explanation for that, but I think his observation 
is in line with what we've seen with customers who are growing hydroponically. So again, I don't I don't really necessarily have an explanation for that. It's just um, you know we we've seen the same thing with our our customers who are trialing like for growing tomatoes hydroponically. Okay, um, we've got some others we're going to save till the end, but uh, this one let's see. I don't know if you can answer this. What is the right amount of water to add when blending? Uh, liters per cubic yard. Do you have any measurements, or do you just have? Does it depend? Um, so no. Well. Uh, you know, we, we actually have an entirely uh, separate presentation uh, on this uh, particular topic, but the, the, the short answer is um, on a weight basis, we recommend a tart moisture content at time of blending of 60 to 65 percent for a, a peat hydrofiber blend. Um, and that's what we've found has been the right threshold. Um, when you start getting up above 70 percent water content, uh, the mixes start clumping uh, below, uh, you know, 55% moisture content, and you start having wetability issues. Um, so again, that's just from testing. Now, as far as you know, what the amount is per cubic yard or something like that. I mean, that's that's a calculation that we could do, and um, that's something that we could, you know, circle back on with this person if they want to reach out to us. Um, we we can make a recommendation. But in general, we we recommend on a by weight basis, uh, 60 to 65% moisture. And there are some, uh, you know, field tests that we actually recommend uh, that make it very easy to assess the moisture content without having any fancy uh, moisture measuring equipment. Very good. Hope that helps, uh, Marin. All right, we'll keep going here. Okay. All right. So uh, area two is uh, proper fill, and uh, this is an area that we've um, been very grateful that. Um, uh, being able to partner up with agronomics, um, you know, being able to come in and run uh, filling uh, testing with uh, all their various pot fillers, and it's really helped us uh, come up with a lot of these recommendations that we're about to make here. So uh, first, let's talk about hydrofiber itself. Uh, so for those of you who haven't actually touched hydrofiber in its raw state, it's very fluffy. Um, some people have de described it as being like cotton. Uh, some people have described it as looking very similar to insulation, um, but at the end of the day, um, it is very, um, very structured, and when you blend it with other raw materials, it really does form a matrix-like substrate, and uh, this um, helps, it, this is very nice because it, it creates a situation where you have very desirable um, physical properties within that mix. However, the downside to this is that when you go to fill a container, particularly very small containers, what we can have are what, we're, what we refer to are voids in cells or pots. And these voids, voids are really nothing more than excessive air pockets um, that collapse when you add water to them. So what we found very early on um, when we started doing this testing is that when we have these very large excessive air pockets in the containers, and the, the, the trays or pots go out into the greenhouse and they get watered in for the first time, uh, those air pockets then uh, uh, shrink. And um, it, it, it looks like the media is, is shrinking and, and then therefore uh, the fill's not very good. And so what we found through the testing is that there's really two key areas that we need to focus on, and that is adjusting the flow out of the pot filling equipment, and then the second one is adjusting the compaction um, that the pot filling equipment provides. And so in general, what we found through our testing is that four inch pots and larger are relatively easy to fill. Uh, we found that th these um, pot sizes do require some tweaking on the machinery, but not that much. And so they're, they're relatively easy. The, the trays and pot sizes where you need to be concerned are with 1006 packs and smaller. So a 1006 pack, um, the opening or diameter of the cell is roughly the same size as a 72. However, it's kind of tricky to fill because it's very deep. And so this combination of a narrow opening with a deep cell can make it tricky. And so this one, um, as well as 72s and 105 trays, uh, can make it a little tricky to fill these, um, these uh, sizes. So if we go to the next slide, uh, the first area that we want to talk about, I mentioned, uh, there's two areas that you want to uh, look at. Um, the first one is compaction. So um, the first thing uh, mentioning is that this is an agronomics KVXL machine. We have a 1006 flat on this uh, conveyor here. 
And the first thing that we want to do is we want to layer roughly two to three fingers in depth of substrate on top of this tray. Okay, so that's the first thing that you want to do. Then uh, when you're setting up the machine, you want to raise your plow, which is this bent piece of metal uh, sitting right above the flat, so that you have roughly two inches of clearance between the top of the flat and the bottom of the plow. Okay. The, the purpose of the plow is to help level out the media, so you want to provide some, some leveling. Um, but the thing is, is um, many growers have the plow set at the height of the flat, and what we found through all our testing is it actually rakes the fiber out of the cells. And so by raising that plow to two inches above, we, we still get some leveling, but we're not actually raking substrate out of the cells. The next thing the tray goes under as it passes through the pot filler is the compactor, which is basically a wheel that has blades. And you want to set this compactor as well as the roller that's right behind it um, about at the, the level of the top of the uh, flat. And so what this does is, um, you know, the plow does the leveling. Then once the media is leveled, it then goes under the compactor, which then pushes it into the cells. And then after that, it goes under the brush. Um, the brush, largely, we don't re really recommend any changes, but you do, um, uh, we do recommend playing with some of the air nozzles that are on there just to blow any excess media off the tops of the pots or trays. Um, and what we found is that, um, you know, following these steps, uh, whether it's a 1006 or a 72 or a 105, uh, minimizes these voids, and in most instances, uh, growers are able to eliminate these voids altogether and they're able to achieve adequate fill. Okay, the other um, thing to be aware of when you're doing your pot filling is flow. And so in, this, in these two images um, are pictures of the agronomics hydrofiber soil conditioner. This is uh, a, a, something that we developed alongside with agronomics to help manage flow coming out of any top mounted uh, hopper uh, pot filling piece of equipment. So. It doesn't, uh, you don't have to have an ag agronomics pot filler. Uh, it, work, it plays nice with uh, most manufacturers as long as the pot filler is a configuration where it's got a hopper mounted on top of the pot filler. And so um, now I will say that this piece of equipment is not required, but it does make it significantly easier to fill containers, uh, specifically 1006 packs. And uh, so if you didn't, if you opted not to use this soil conditioner on the pot filler, uh, the way we would manage flow would be typically by lowering the gate on the mouth of the hopper and speeding up the belt speed in the hopper itself. The, the end result is that you want to have flow out of the hopper of the media in a very water-like fashion. So in other words, you want to avoid any large clumps uh, falling out of the mouth of the hopper. And really the best way to illustrate this, I know we'll have these, uh, it's, um, uh, the booth at Cultivate, um, and, and really the best way to see this in action is to see it with and without the uh, soil conditioner in operation. Uh, but again, water-like flow out of the mouth of the hopper is key, whether you're using a soil conditioner or not. Okay, so here's some takeaway points here. Uh, mentioned again, managing flow is key, and you can do that by either adjusting the gate height and belt speed within the hopper, or the easiest way, and really what we recommend, is with the agronomic soil conditioner. Uh, something that I haven't really touched on yet, but correct moisture. So uh, this really goes back to you don't want to have your mixes too wet. So you want to you want to make sure you're in that 60 to 65 percent moisture content range. Again, once you start getting over 70 percent moisture in most substrates, the mixes start clumping, and then you're going to you're going to have a really hard time uh, filling any pot, regardless of what mix you're using. Uh, you want to have the, comp the plow high but compactor low in order to get the right amount of compaction. The key here with regards to compaction is you want to minimize those voids, but you don't want to overdo the compaction because uh, overdoing the compaction uh, will, will artificially remove the desirable airspace um, that is, that's going to be beneficial to the plant. Uh, for those of you who have older pot fillers that have propellers on them, uh, we don't see these as much today, but these propellers do work, and we can make some rec recommendations how to utilize these. And then the other thing that we've seen, um, many, many of our customers have not had to uh, make any change with regards to how their transplanters are operating. 
However, um, some have commented that they have had to increase the depth setting on the transplanter slightly in order to compensate for the sponginess uh, that hydrofiber tends to create in substrates. Okay, uh, the third area that I want to mention to everybody is really lime rate and pH management. And this uh, next section is based off of some work that we did with Dr. Ryan Dixon at the University of New Hampshire last year and uh, really really did a great job in, in um, helping us learn some things about hydrofiber specifically related to buffering. And so one thing that Jennifer mentioned earlier is that um, you know hydrofiber itself has a pH of four and a half. And so um, the question that we got initially is, okay, well, if the pH is four and a half and you know peat has a pH of let's say three and a half to four in general, um, why does why does hydrofiber not behave like peat? And uh, the short answer is, is that hydrofiber has a very low lime requirement in order to raise the pH up to a value of, let's say, 6. Um, so uh, we found through the testing that a, a cubic yard of hydrofiber requires really only a, uh, a quarter of a pound per cubic yard to adjust that pH up to 6. You contrast that with a cubic yard of peat moss, uh, that same cubic yard required a, about 10 pounds per yard of lime to get that pH up to 6. So those two raw materials have very different lime requirements. Our rule that we recommend is that if you are purely just substituting perlite in the substrate with hydrofiber, we don't recommend any lime change. Uh, perlite itself does have a higher pH than hydrofiber does, but both materials um, have low lime requirements, and so therefore uh, we don't need to make any adjustment with regards to lime rate. However, uh, for those customers who are looking to uh, reduce the amount of peat and replace with hydrofiber, we do recommend that you reduce your lime rate. Um, now, our hydrofiber team, um, our technical service team, uh, we can make recommendations um, uh, for a wide variety of different substrates with hydrofiber uh, based on lime rate. Uh, we have a calculator based on the research uh, that Dr. Ryan Dixon did, and uh, we can help make a recommendation for you. Uh, but the last thing that I want to mention with regards to this is that um, whatever you do, um, if you're blending yourself, it's, it's always important to test and verify your lime rates on a small scale uh, before rolling it out into full-scale production because uh, there's so many different factors that can influence the, um, the pH of your substrate, and it's just always important to do your due diligence. Okay. And lastly, you know, I'll just wrap up with some pictures of the field. and. Uh, you know, because it's, uh, we're all in a festive um, time of year, we're starting to uh, be thinking about poinsettia production. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, start thinking about Christmas in July, or almost July. Okay, uh, so um, this is some tri these are just trials that we've had in the field um, with various growers that are comparing uh, mostly 80% peat, 20% perlite mixes, which is kind of, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, the industry standard. Uh, here we're comparing a 25% and 30% hydrofiber, 160. Uh, by the way, 160 is our most popular grade of hydrofiber. Uh, roughly about 70% of our customers use this particular grade. Okay, here's another grower who's now testing 30% and 40% hydrofiber. Uh, and this is with a coarser grade, the 365. Daniel, and are these, are these uh, shots from this sure. season? Uh, no, these last two pictures were actually from, uh, I believe these were actually two years ago. Yep. Okay. Uh, so now just to, um, this was also taken about, I believe, two years ago. Um, this is a grower in California, just to give you an idea for when you combine core and hydrofiber. So this particular customer wanted to remove peat and replace with hydrofiber. Uh, we actually, in this instance, had um, uh, more of a, a positive effect on growth when we took the peat out. Um, we were trialing two different fiber sizes, 065 and 090. Okay, we can go on. Okay, so this is early on in the trials. Um, here, uh, the grower is looking at a 50 core, 50 peat, and they're comparing it to a 55 core, 45 hydrofiber, 090. At this stage, uh, both very comparable plants. Here's a grower in uh, the southeast U.S., uh, I believe this was last year, um, doing an 80-20 peat perlite control versus a 70-30 hydrofiber mix. 
Again, very similar plant quality. No changes in fertility, no changes in irrigation. Okay, another uh, customer now in the Midwest United States. Um, again, I believe this is a 75-25 peat perlite mix. They decided to go to a 70-30 peat hydrofiber 160. Again, very comparable plant result, uh, plant growth results. Um, very nice root development. And lastly, this is actually a customer uh, from last season um, who was growing in a 70-30 uh, peat hydrofiber mix. And uh, very nice results there. Great. Thanks for that, Daniel. Always informative, as usual. So as we mentioned before, anybody that's working with hydrofiber needs a specialized piece of equipment. Um, there are basically two ways to get a hold of hydrofiber. Uh, we sell hydrofiber uh, directly to growers that are willing to put in equipment and um, who are used to making their own mixes. Uh, they are used to buying in their raw materials already for making their own mixes, and so we're just another raw material that they're purchasing. We also sell our raw materials to some of the largest blenders around the world. Uh, they buy our material and they make premixes, uh, which they sell and market to the marketplace. And we'll talk about a few of our premix uh, suppliers here in a moment. Uh, but everybody needs to use a specialized piece of equipment in order to work with hydrofiber. The reason for that is is that these product, our product arrives is as compressed bales, 50 pounds in weight. Uh, there are 40 bales on a pallet, and uh, there's anywhere from 20 to 22 pallets on a truck. Uh, the bales are highly compressed, and they will actually expand 13 times. So um, the hydrofiber processing unit, um, which we work uh, with agronomics on developing, uh, building, installing, and maintaining, uh, it will actually, it's been designed to maximize bale yield. In fact, uh, from every bale, our customers get just a little bit over uh, one cubic yard uh, fluff material when they work with our specialized piece of equipment. Um, we chose to work with agronomics. Uh, we developed the first pieces of equipment ourselves, but as you guys can clearly see from our presentation, our core business is raw materials. That's what we do really well. Uh, agronomics is the company we've chosen to partner with because their core business is equipment, and they understand the market really well, and we couldn't have found a better partner to work with. Uh, together, like I said, since we started, uh, we've installed more than 40 pieces of equipment together, and we're continuing to install um, a new piece almost weekly right now because of the response in the marketplace. Uh, agronomics does a great job of looking at existing mix lines or existing equipment with customers and then trying to figure out how to take the hydrofiber processing unit and make it rather plug and play and modular in fashion. Um, they build all of our equipment, they install all of, all of our equipment, and they maintain all the equipment. So if the customer has ever any issue, uh, they call it agronomics. We also have one person on our team who travels full time to do nothing else but support the equipment and to make sure there are no issues with blending or filling or anything else equipment related. Um, the screen on the screen right now, Chris is showing you a picture of the hydrofiber processing unit. This is the unit that we have in the market currently. Um, we're just uh, the, the, in a nutshell. Basically, there's a double conveyor system feeding into the box. Uh, the big thing about hydrofiber is, as Daniel said, if you look at it on its own, it's kind of a cottony material. It's hard to get that product to flow. Uh, so in order to get it to flow properly, you have to blend it with a base material. Most of our customers blend it with peat or core. We do have some customers that blend it with bark, um, but the base material goes on the bottom conveyor. Hydrofiber goes on the top conveyor. Um, there's a series of, uh, of pieces of equipment in the, in the actual box frame that will tease that highly compressed bale apart. Um, they are mixed simultaneously, again, in the box. And when they drop below out of the box, um, it's a completely mixed mix. Um, we have some customers that add this hydrofiber processing unit into an existing mix line. Uh, we also have some customers who either did not have a mix line or who um, needed to upgrade their mix line um, but didn't want to put in a didn't want to absorb a huge footprint. They're actually using the hydrofiber processing unit as the actual mixer now. So we have 
both options in the marketplace. And the nice thing about agronomics is they work with the customer to help them figure out which option works best for them. Uh, this particular unit that we're looking at um, has a capacity of 100 yards plus an hour. And uh, we have a lot of customers out there currently using this unit. Uh, this unit, the extra wide, uh, has been built specifically for more of our commercial customers. Uh, this allows customers to feed two bales at a time. Uh, the nice thing about this particular unit is you can feed, feed multiple uh, grades of hydrofiber, uh, which allows the commercial customer in particular to have even more particle diversity in their blends, giving them even more unique properties that they can offer in their premixes that they provide to the marketplace. Uh, it's the same concept as the one I showed you just a moment ago, only it has a capacity of 300 plus yards an hour. This last one is actually a brand new introduction. Um, it's going to be prominently featured in the agronomics booth. Um, this is the hydrofiber expander. Uh, when we started three years ago, we started with the normal unit, which has a high capacity um, of 100 plus yards an hour. There's a lot of growers out there, and there's a lot on this call, I'm sure, that do not need that type of capacity. Um, they're looking for something that's more suitable for a, for a kind of a two production line or less system. Um, this particular machine uh, will have a capacity of about 25 yards. And in this particular instance, we're showing uh, peat moss being shaved into a dosing hopper with the combination of the hydrofiber um, uh, material, again, on a, uh, on a kind of a zero gravity conveyor belt. Um, again, they meet in the middle, and then when they drop, uh, they're conveyed out, and it's a complete mix. Uh, we're showing it with a peat bale shaver, but this could also easily be a hopper feeding into the dosing hopper or another instance. Um, but this has a lower capacity. Again, it's 25 yards. So it makes it more suitable for guys that have smaller operations um, to be able to, uh, to have a hydrofiber mix as well. And then, of course, the last place you can get hydrofiber is from one of our blending partners. We know that not everybody likes to mix themselves. So uh, there's uh, several blending companies out there that have rightfully so chosen hydrofiber as a key component of their mixes and are offering lots of different premix options to the marketplace uh, today. So hopefully by this time in the presentation you're saying, man, Jennifer and Daniel, this sounds awesome. How do we get started? Uh, that's quite simple. First of all, uh, you can call one of us. We'd be happy to talk to you about um, your hydrofiber um, needs. We'd be happy to schedule a personal consultation to come visit with you. We can set up trial material for you. We can work with one of our blender partners to set up trial material. Really, uh, we're open and we work in a variety of different ways, so please reach out to us. Another thing that you might consider if you're coming to the Cultivate show is to sit, attend one of our Cultivate live sessions. Uh, we've been rather general in our webinar session uh, as we have a variety of different uh, different groups on the call today, people that have a lot of experience with hydrofiber, people that don't have much experience with hydrofiber. But we are hosting 10 Cultivate Live um, sessions at the Cultivate show. This is taking place in the 3700 aisle. And here we'll be able to dig into some more specific topics. So you mentioned, you heard Daniel mention just a moment ago that we actually have a specific webinar that we provide on um, how to know if your blends are at the right moisture level or not. We've done a series of webinars over the years. They're all filed and archived. Um, you can reach out to Laurence Plez, who was one of the people mentioned in our team, uh, uh, on our team slide, and she can actually help you get access to the hub, which is our online site, which uh, allows you to access some of the ma main webinars we've done in the past. We can also provide them to you through one of our technical service specialists. But this Cultivate Live sessions, again, we have 10 of them scheduled. Uh, I'd like to point out that um, a couple of them are actually going to be done by Dr. Bruce Bugsby, who we did not share research on in this webinar, but he's from Utah State. He will be talking specifically about uh, woods and what makes different woods, woods different. So that one in particular, if you've been following hydrofiber for a while, might be very interesting to you because uh, he's, gonna, he's actually done a lot of research to look and see uh, what makes woods different. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, please come visit us at the agronomics booth. Uh, we will be there the entire show with our entire team, and we'd love to have you come and visit us and talk to you more about hydrofiber. I've also shown you uh, where you can find some of our blender partners at the uh, Cultivate show. They also, I'm sure, would be happy to tell you about the hydrofiber premix options that they're providing to the marketplace. And might I mention one last thing about the Cultivate Live session. Chris, if you could go back one slide. Uh, the last 
sessions on both days, both Sunday and Monday, are being moderated by Mr. Paul Pilon um, from Perennial Solutions. We've got a series of uh, grower panels. Uh, each afternoon we'll be featuring three hydrofiber growers who will be there to answer your questions um, uh, on everything as it relates to hydrofiber and the transition that they had to uh, make at their business to move to hydrofiber blend. So I would like, I would invite everybody uh, in particular to uh, head to the Cultivate Live sessions because I think they're going to be really uh, interesting. And lastly, I guess if there are any questions, Daniel and I are both available um, for as long as necessary to answer any questions today on the webinar. I thank you all for joining for sure. We appreciate the interest. Well, I knew there would be questions, and we've saved some interesting ones here for the end. So let's kind of go through them. I'll try to do it in the, in the order that they came in as best I can. Uh, Jim wants to know, uh, has, the, has, uh, has the fiber been tested with outdoor overwintering? I would I probably guess perennials on that one or, or nursery material. Yes. Absolutely. The largest perennial growers in the country are actively working with it and uh, have seen great results. In most instances, they're finding that products that typically did not root well in bark-based mixes root really well uh, in hydrofiber bark-based mixes. All right. Uh, we had a question about orchids, and Hector, uh, Hector is growing anthuriums, a 12 to 16-month crop, and is wondering about which of the, uh, the four different fibers he might choose for that and why. And by the same token, Willie wants to know, how do you choose between the, 60, the 0, 065, 0, 090, 160, and 365? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, for that crop length, I would probably recommend the 160 or higher, so 160, 365, or 510. And then the next thing really comes down to physical properties. And, um, you know, as far as physical properties, the way uh, we would determine that or uh, match that up with your current mix would be to get samples of the mix that you're currently using. Um, you know, we have a barometer where we can measure the physical properties, the water holding capacity as well as airspace. Um, and then we can come up with some blends with hydrofiber uh, to make a recommendation for you. Um, and so that, that would be um, the next, next thing that I would recommend after you you know, we, we, we minimize down to three different fibers based on crop length, and then we then make a recommendation based on your uh, physical properties of your current mix. All right. You, meant, you mentioned water holding capacity. Cassidy wants to know how, you, how would you recommend that uh, you measure water holding capacity of a, a mix that's got hydrofiber in it compared to a standard mix? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, too. Um, so the way that we do it is we use the North Carolina State uh, University Parameter. Um, which is pretty much a standard uh, method of testing physical properties. Um, a lot of independent labs use the same method. Um, and so, again, we use that in our lab, and that tells us the, a lot of different uh, uh, physical parameters. It tells us total porosity, container capacity, airspace. Um, and so, uh, basically, what we recommend is getting samples of the mix currently without hydrofiber, and then uh, we can uh, make up some similar mixes with hydrofiber, run them through the same test, and see how they compare, and then make a decision that way. All right. Um, the smallest container you showed, Daniel, was a 1006. But what about mm -hmm. propagation? Can you use hydrofiber in propagation? Yeah. yeah, so we've actually done a series of studies with Dr. Glenn Fain at Auburn, uh, specifically on propagation. And, uh, you know, we'll, we're we're planning on doing a, a session at the Cultivate Live uh, this year uh, focused on propagation, um, but most of what we've done has been focused on liner propagation. Uh, we've done work with uh, seedling propagation. The thing about seedling propagation that makes it a little bit more difficult is just, you know, most of the uh, propagation trays are like a 288 or, or smaller. And um, I would say that, you know, 72 and 105 are, are you know, once you know how to build them through traditional pot filling equipment, um, you know, those are no problem uh, to propagate, um, you know, with hydrofiber mixes. Uh, but when you start getting to smaller cell, cell trays, filling those containers tends to be a little bit more difficult. Um, so most of the work that we've done has been on rooting cuttings, uh, and we've gone up to percentages all the way up to 50%, and uh, they've rooted uh, just as good as the controls without without hydrofiber. Okay. Yeah, Gail noted that maybe with hydrofiber's uh, tendency to dry down from the top 
would that cause issues if you were doing, say, woody uh, plant uh, liner propagation? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of any. Um, you know, we, we don't have as much experience with woody liner propagation, um, but we do have some folks who have done it, and uh, I'm not aware of any issues. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the experience that we have, most of the testing that we have done um, has been with annual, annual crops. Gotcha. But, hey, it's, it's, it's a pretty new product, uh, and there's right. lots of research to be done. So uh, I'm sure Absolutely. You'll, be, you'll be doing more. Uh, Michael wants to know if there's been any studies of uh, blends of perlite and hydrofiber compared to peat and hydrofiber. Uh, would you want to do that? That doesn't seem like it might make sense. Uh, I mean, potentially. Um, you know, we, we, haven't, we haven't come across anyone who specifically wanted to do that type of research, but, um, you know, we – uh, at the end of the day, we, we're just a raw material option, um, so uh, we play nice with a lot of other raw materials. Um, it's just that, you know, with the customers that we've interacted with, um, we haven't come across anyone wanting to, to evaluate that. All right. And speaking of playing nice, uh, this is an OMRI-listed product, so mm -hmm. it can be used in organic production. And Jocelyn wants to know about its uh, compatibility with beneficials, biofungicides, other things like that. Any issues there? No, we're not aware of any issues, but um, you know we don't we don't have any uh, you know hard test data on that. Um, it's it's purely anecdotal um, things based based on what we've seen in the field. We haven't run into any issues yet, but we we also don't have a lot of testing data on. It. All right, uh, Steve notes um, he says it's a great product. There you go, testimonial. But uh, he's seen a lot of algae growth on the soil surface. Uh, so is that something that you've got to kind of take into consideration and, and deal with more so than you would on your standard potting mix? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, the algae thing is, is something that we, we've actually got several university trials in place right now really to assess um, if, if it is the hydrofiber uh, that leads to more algae. You know, we've, we've heard anecdotally in the field a wide range of things. We've heard some people say that mixes with hydrofiber are worse with regards to algae. We've heard some people say that they're better. Um, the vast majority of people say it's really no different um, than a peat perlite mix, for example. I think at the end of the day, what, what we're seeing in the trials that we have, and although the trials are still underway, is that it really comes down to water management, um, you know, and, and uh, the surface drying. Uh, actually, some of the customers who claim it's better have been the ones who, who utilize the surface drying aspect of it to help manage the algae more effectively. Um, but, you know, again, the, the verdict's really still out, and it's something that we're actively pursuing at this time. All right, and last question, and it, I don't know if it'll be a, a long answer or, or an easy answer. Okay. There are other uh, wood fiber products available in the marketplace. Uh, what are the difference, differences between hybrid, hydrofiber and them, in a nutshell? Okay. We could actually make it as long or as short as we as he, as want to. We could also probably specifically hold a webinar on that particular session, and there's a couple of academics on this call that could help us with that for sure. I think in a nutshell, there's kind of three things that make us different. Uh, first of all, our, our, our system for how we go about processing our wood fiber is very different from others. Uh, the fact that we use heat pressure and steam, um, it's very unique, um, and uh, we uh, others are using a technology that's that's not that. Uh, secondly, we also only use one species. That species allows us that a species allows us to have a very clean, very consistent uh, material. And then, lastly, uh, because of the way that we make the fibers, it's a it's a process that allows us to uh, be very gentle with the fibers. Gotcha. All right, now. Last question for now, but not the last chance to ask questions. If you have others, or if we didn't quite get to yours, or get enough uh, meat uh, out of them, you can reach them both at their email addresses. I'll put them right there, and I'll, uh, in fact, when we finish up the webinar, I'll pop back to that slide just so you can do it. Um, if you want to rewatch this webinar uh, or share it with uh, colleagues, uh, employees, your boss, or whoever, uh, within a half hour or 45 minutes, I should have it archived at uh, www.growertalks.com slash webinars. So look for it there. And a quick little commercial for me. I've got an upcoming webinar next Tuesday. Um, 
just in case you happen to get some weeds in your hydrofiber mix, horrors, <laughs> or in any other mix. Uh, we're doing a webinar uh, with Dr. Jeffrey Durr from the University of Virginia uh, on common weeds and their management in container nursery production next Tuesday, July 3rd, right before the 4th of July, so tune into that same time, same place. And, uh, well, that's pretty much it. So I appreciate everybody who joined in today for uh, Jennifer and all the folks at Profile Products and certainly on behalf of all my staff at Ball Publishing who have beautiful profiles. I'm Chris Bates saying so long, everybody.